Excellent. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Generally Irritable. You're going to wait for me for one second while I figure out what in the heck is wrong with my Facebook feed. Do, 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 do. You're about to view. Let's see. As usual, everything was working fine until we went live. Why does that always happen, Bethany? Why does that always happen? Tell me. Murphy's Law. Tell me why. So while I'm doing this, let's see. I had this happen before. Let me see if I can get this to go again. Do, 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 do. Why is it being silly? Now we're going to add it back in. And we're going to go now. See, I had to, this happened last time the, that it was, it was silly. I had to delete it out of the broadcast and then add it back in. So we'll see if it works. And there we go. We're live everywhere. Hello, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. We're here. Generally irritable. I totally just started sweating too. It might be this tea. I'm not certain. Maybe we'll set it aside here for a minute. I'm really, really, really excited uh, this evening to have my guest, Bethany. It's Cyberson, right? Yep. You got Cyberson. It. Bethany Cyberson. I said it correctly. Um, from Expose. She's the executive director of Expose, an anti-trafficking organization. Uh, and you do some other stuff too, Bethany. Why don't we start with a couple minutes of you letting the, well, let me start with this. So the topic of conversation for this evening is whether or not prostitution is really a victimless crime. Uh, Vermont right now is, uh, look, it has a bill in in uh, in the legislature that they're considering that would start a committee to consider legalizing prostitution in the state of Vermont. And given, you know, I, you know, that really sparked my interest when I heard that because we've had a couple of sex trafficking rings broken up in uh, the Burlington area in the last couple of years, two of them. Wow, what is that ticking? It's still doing it. That's going to make me crazy. I'm going to try not to let it distract me, y'all. But if you can hear that ticking, that sounds like somebody typing or like static. We tried to correct that before the broadcast. Uh, multiple headphones and things weren't working. I wonder if I just take this out. I'm just, we're going to try just using the speaker. Because it's really annoying. And if we get an echo, then... We'll come back to it. It's actually not letting me go back to the speakers, is it? Nope. Okay. Well, I guess I have to wear my headphones. All right. Well, y'all will just have to deal with the ticking, and so will I. Do, 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 do. What you got, babe? Oh, there's the test. Da, 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 da. Okay. Can you still hear me, Bethany? Yep. Okay. I can still hear you. Okay. We're good. Um, man, who wants to be my audio person? We need an audio person for the show, but well, I'll, I'll try to ignore it. You guys ignore it too. So this bill I thought was fascinating because I really, um, this is another one of those topics that I'm on the fence about. Bethany, you and I were talking before the show started about how I have, I actually have a really good friend who is an escort and she is a person that you don't normally hear about in these conversations. She, uh, she's not a drug addict. She, she doesn't do drugs at all. You know, she'll have a drink occasionally, but she's not a substance abuser. Um, and she really went into the business. Uh, she started out doing pornography and then she said that it, the industry changed and she didn't like what was happening. And so she turned to being an escort and she feels like it's empowering. Right. But then I also know people because we've worked with organizations that help fight sex trafficking. 
you hear all of these stories about women who, and men, boys, girls, who, you know, are, um, are either drug addicts or vulnerable in some other way that makes them susceptible to being coerced into, uh, into sex work. And so it's, and even my friend that's an escort would tell me stories about how the people that she worked with, how many of them were drug addicts and how often people were committing suicide. And I just think, okay, this is one of those things that there's no cut and dry answer. There's the, there is the, the Christian moral side of me that says, you know, this isn't good for people and we need to, you know, be careful about who we give ourselves to. And, and then there's the libertarian side of me that says, well, if it's a consensual relationship between two human or a trans consensual transaction, you know, what's the problem with it? And so I really am torn between those two sides. And I, and I wanted to have you on Bethany, especially because I know the work that you do in helping rescue people from being trafficked. And so you really see the, the, the seedy underbelly of, of sex work and how, you know, this, this friend of mine is not, is not the rule, right? She is the exception to the rule. And so I really want to hear your experience in helping people get out of it, um, sharing your knowledge uh, with, you know, what it looks like when places legalize prostitution and sex work. I know you're not perfectly familiar with all of the bills in Vermont and all of that stuff, but you've, you know, you have experience with what that looks like. And so, so that's the setup, you guys. I've got Bethany here at per usual, uh, you guys, uh, all my listeners, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, write questions in the chat. Make sure if you have any questions for Bethany, if you have any questions for me, if there's any other information that you want to see me, you know, add to the description later so we can look at it together, uh, you know, just write something in the chat. Let me know. And Bethany, if you would take a couple of minutes and just describe uh, yourself, describe who you are, how you got into this and why it's so important to you. All right. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. So yeah, my name is Bethany and um, I've been married 24 years. I have six kids ranging from 20, uh, a 20 year old son down to twin, uh, identical twin boys that are five <gasps> what? and everything in between. Oh um, so I'm pretty busy, um, homeschooling the younger ones and tr transporting the older ones, uh, that are in high school to a, a private school. Um, and then managing the ones that are, you know, adults and in college and stuff like that. So, uh, that keeps me pretty busy. Um, and I got started in all of this. Um, actually I'll go back real quickly and mention that I, uh, I did write a book, um, has nothing to do with this topic whatsoever, but, um, I went through my own 14 years of infertility and seven miscarriages and then oh, four wow. years of trying to adopt with three failed adoptions and really felt like God wanted me to write a book, um, to just give people hope throughout that process. So if people are struggling um, in that process, or um, I've had people from around the world um, write me and tell me that they didn't struggle with it, but their daughter struggles with it or their neighbor and that they read my book and it, it helped them to have much more sympathy and empathy for people um, that were the, their loved ones that are struggling with that. And it helped them to know how to better talk to them and uh, care for, care for and love them. So um, yeah. Uh, so proud accomplishment. I'd never thought that I would be an author. So that was, that's been kind of fun in the last cool. year and a half. Um, so what got me started on um, working in the anti-trafficking movement was because in 2007, <clears throat> um, we lived in a teeny tiny little town of 2,500 people. And we at the time lived on a cul-de-sac street with only seven houses. And uh, in July of that year, the FBI SWAT team, five local police departments, they all swarmed our tiny little street um, and wow. descended on the house directly across the street from us. And that house um, had a, a man and a woman living there. 
and they built that house together. Um, but they, uh, it, he was not the father of those children. Uh, they were all three her children from a previous relationship. And um, she worked faithfully as a nurse third shift. And when she was working as third shift, he began raping and molesting her middle child, who was 11 years old at the time. Uh And after a period of time, kind of like drugs, marijuana, no longer satisfactory, you move to something harder and harder. Um, To quickly speed through this horrific story, um, he began recording himself doing that and uploading that to pedophile websites. And then eventually, over the course of the two and a half years, he began um, driving her into um, our state's capital and began selling her to other men. and trafficking her. And so this tiny, tiny little body, I look at my little girl who's 12 and I look at just the frailty and the innocence of her body. And I, I just, you know, it it makes me fight. It makes me fight as hard as I know how. Um, I was never trained in this, never educated in any way, but I just, as a mom, I just couldn't sit by and say, that was a tragic story. That's really too bad. I, it just sickened me to the core. And I said, I will fight for the rest of my life to protect children. And it has, you know, turned into the, the realization because back then I didn't even know that it had a name called trafficking. And I didn't realize the, the vast amount of people that it can affect. It affects children. It affects women. It affects men it affects the lgbt community so i fight for all of these people now and and to just protect them from not just trafficking but any kind of sexual exploitation yeah that is uh, like listening to you tell that story it's whenever i hear stuff like this it's so overwhelming i start to cry and i get angry because it's, it's like you said, you have an 11 year old daughter and you know how small and fragile her body is. Right. And the fact that somebody could do this to a child. It's um, and to see the, the escalation, right? So to go from being, you know, to go from just being, I hate to say just being a rapist, like not to be dismissive, right, but right. to go from that to, Oh, it would be a great. Oh, now I'm going to just share it with everybody. First of all, how stupid do you have to be? I'm sorry. Like you have to be really stupid to record yourself doing something like that. And then like not realize that whatever. And then, and then further escalation to, Oh, the good idea is to take her into town. And you just go, how did the mom not know? How did the girl not say anything? What about the siblings? And you just, like, how is it possible for these things to go on undetected? Yeah. And they do all the time. There's a, a really beautiful survivor out of, um, it's, I always forget, it's like one of the Midwest states. It's Illinois or Ohio. Um, but she was 15 when her trafficker started trafficking her. He um, brought her to a location, drugged her drink, um, took off her clothes, did things, took photos, and used those photos then to coerce her into coming out of her bedroom window every night. So for two years, this woman was trafficked, this, not woman, this minor, this child was trafficked. Um, And he, he ended up giving her a separate cell phone so that her parents couldn't, you know, track what was happening or anything. And so, and he said, if, if you, if you tell anybody, I will show all of these photos to your parents. I'm going to, I'm going to plaster them all over your social media. I'm going to plaster them throughout your high school. And so fear and shame kept her going out every single night. It wasn't something she wanted to do. She was traumatized beyond belief. There was tragedy after tragedy that happened in her life. At one point she decided that she was going to tell and he had made threats that he would um, harm her family and harm her animals. And he followed through on that. He took, stole her dog out of her front yard, killed the dog and chopped it up into pieces and delivered it to her family's mailbox. So this is a survivor and she does, she does international work and speaks all around the world now um, telling her story, but she's also created a, a really great foundation um, and a, a campaign that she calls SOAP, which is an acronym, um, 
because she started asking herself, you know, when I was in between clients, what would have I wanted? What would have I needed to try to escape? And she thought about every time that she was in a hotel, those little teeny tiny bars of soap in the bathroom, um, the trafficker would tell her that you have to clean up in between every um, client. And so she would go in and, you know, have to tear open those bars of soap. And so now her campaign, um, she goes across the country training um, groups of people um, on how to run this soap campaign. So we've run this campaign multiple times in, in my state and we've had success. We've had, we've had um, young women who are being trafficked find the bars of soap. Oh, so I didn't finish explaining. So on the back side of the bar of soap is the 1-800 trafficking number or it's 888, uh, the 888 uh, human yeah. trafficking uh, hotline number. And so yeah. they would, um, you know, if they were being trafficked, they would be able to see that number and be able to call and get some help. And so we've run that campaign multiple times in our, in our state. Yeah. That's it right there. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. So uh, I can't see it super well, but yeah. So her name is <laughs> Teresa Flores and yeah. she, um, she created this out of her wow. own tragedy, out of her own personal trauma. And we, we have had uh, success. We have had young girls come out of trafficking situations because they found that phone number. Wow. That yeah. is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Um, so would you turn a fan on for me, honey? He can't hear me. Hold on one second. Honey, can you turn the fan on? Um, so, okay. I'm like, I'm trying to collect myself. I have so many questions and like, I want to stay on topic. Um, so it's, oh, we're already getting some comments and some folks, uh, tagging their friends in the, in the comment section to come check out our conversation. Um, and it's, it's funny. Some of the member we were, so Bethany and I were talking before the program and she said, who is your viewership? And I said, well, it really stretches across, uh, all over the, all over the spectrum. I said, but I do have a lot of libertarian folks. Um, and a lot of Christians, a lot of conservatives. So I said, they're either going to be very anti or they're going to be very libertarian and you do you. And it's, it's funny because the comments are, are highlighting that exactly what I said. And I love what Olga said, especially um, decriminalize prostitution. And we need to work better to protect those who are being trafficked against their will. And I think that's kind of what I said is, you know, when you have a, uh, an industry like this that is so rife and so susceptible to, um, uh, you know, just bad stuff, bad guys, people taking advantage of people, being vulnerable and, and all of that kind of stuff. Oh, that ticking is making me crazy, babe. I don't know what I'm going to do. We got to do something before the next time. Oh my God, you guys, somebody needs to send me some legit headphones. Um, so how do you, because there's, there's a few things, right? So let's talk about what happens when, when we're dealing with um, legalization and stuff like that. So one of the big, uh, one of the big, where am I going to, where can I find it? Um, so one of the things that I found really interesting when I was doing some research for the show today is and I, and I knew this because my, my, my girlfriend, I'll call her Jay. Uh, my girlfriend said that this, this uh, anti-trafficking law, it's, it's getting worse. The anti-trafficking law actually had a lot of unintended consequences, a lot of negative unintended consequences in that it sort of drove prostitution deeper underground. So whereas it used to be that, uh, her as an escort or uh, other folks that were escorts um, could, you know, do background checks on the per Johns. I don't know. What's the appropriate word nowadays? Is John still an yeah, appropriate they, word? Yeah, generally still use Johns. Okay. Uh, so the Johns, they would be able to do background checks. They would be able to communicate with one another. Um, they could make sure that things were up and up and they could make them do like testing and all this other stuff. 
Um, so this is a great article that talks a little bit about that. You know, she said un the unfortunate consequence was it drove it deeper underground. And so you had people who, instead of selling on these websites, they're actually now on the street, which is more dangerous. They're not able to do background checks on the people that they're um, transacting with. And so you go, okay, so we're trying to do these laws to make it safer for people and that makes it worse, you know, how is that possible? And, you know, of course it makes some kind of sense, right? Like you, you, you know, you realize, okay, this is a, a, a way to make it safer for people. But then you shared with me, if share with our audience, Bethany, a little bit, what your experience, what you've seen happens to the community uh, surrounding areas and things when, prostitution is legalized when sex work is legalized so the only state in our country where uh, prostitution is fully legalized right now is nevada it isn't even in las vegas it's in the seven surrounding counties around las vegas mm -hmm. um, but it had also been legalized in rhode island for i believe it was 19 years oh. and rhode island is um, a fascinating case study on it because, and I don't know all of their details and facts either, but I work with a brilliant woman, a PhD researcher, author of many, many um, uh, studies and stuff like that um, named Donna Hughes, who mm. works in Rhode Island and lives in Rhode Island. Um, brilliant, brilliant woman. Um, but I work with her and, and the, the work, she was a catalyst in helping to get it, it, um, illegal again, because the case study for in Rhode Island was that prior to it being legalized um, there, they, or I should say after it legalized, what they saw was um, a huge increase in uh, multiple things. There was a huge increase in trafficking. There was a huge increase in um, drugs that came into the city. Mm. There was a, an increase in, um, violence towards women uh in that that happened after it was legalized there was wow. an increase in um petty crime and robberies and things like that a around um providence where it was legalized and there was just there, they saw an increase in, in overall crime in their area and so and then also they were seeing, you know, a, a, along with the increase of trafficking, they were seeing that with, with minors. Um, wow. And then people would come um, from out of state to, um, you know, buy services with with children and minors and, oh, wow. you know, and people that were not minors as well. So then you So it's like they, so like one of the concerns about legalizing marijuana is that it's like drug tourism. Right. Exactly. And so, so this is like sex, sex tourism. tourism destination, which is exactly what everybody knows of Las Vegas. Right. Like what stays, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And that isn't between two married consent, you know, consenting adults. That whole saying starts because they're that's exactly what they're talking about, you know. And so um, in in Nevada, uh, the the violence against women and the murder rate against women is 60 percent higher and i don't memorize very i have a very bad memory in general especially with numbers and stats um i usually have to have my stats in front of me um but i can i can remember that one because it's so um just so sad and so awful it is 60 percent higher than the next highest state which is new york state 60 percent higher and they, that's wild they directly link that to the legalization of prostitution there um so because so you because said harm as, as or violence against women to, right did you say it was harm like violence against women or murder i'm trying to remember exactly murder. what you murder wow yeah so but they they um have done studies on why that is and obviously it's it cut, boils down to if men can go and buy sex from women over and over again, and they begin to just see women as nothing more mm, than a commodity, a commodity. To be purchased, yep. then it's kind of like, well, what good are you to me? You're just something I purchase. I can slap you. I can hit you. I can do whatever. Oh, wow. And that may happen within the confines of that, that transaction, but that translates outside of that transaction. 
Um, there was another uh, study done on si uh, eight 16 year old males. So all minors and they, they were super brave and I was, I was really proud of them. I don't know them. I wasn't a part of this. I just happened to see the video, but I was just really proud that these boys would stand up and say this, but they, they were all talking about how they had this porn addiction. And they were saying that because they have such an intense porn addiction, now of course, mm. this is slightly, you know, off the topic of, of prostitution, but because they have this porn addiction, mm -hmm. they're constantly seeing women as just something to be used. And so they, mm. the person doing the study and the interviewing asked each one of the boys at one point, you know, has having a porn addiction changed your view of the women around you? Across the board, every single 16 year old male that was asked, there was eight of them, all of them said, absolutely. It has made me have little respect for women. I don't respect their bodies. I don't respect that no is no. But then the most, tra tr the most tragic answer that was given was one, one young boy and he started crying. He said, yeah, I, I see women as um, something to be used. And when I look at a woman on, uh, on, on the street and a, say a teenage girl is walking past me, the only thing I think about now is how I want to rape her. And he said, and before I had a porn addiction, I never had thoughts of hurting women. So now translate that back to the conversation of what's happening in Las Vegas or in Nevada. When women are only viewed as a commodity, as something to be used and abused and thrown away when you're done with, that's going to have an effect on the other women in your life or the other women that are surrounding you, the, the woman that walks down the street and you happen to see her. So yeah, it has a huge effect. Well, and I know like, you know, it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to parse out the different aspects of sex work, right? So you have porn, you have prostitution, escorts, you know, there's kind of like different segments of it, but they really, I don't know, in my mind, to me, I lump them all together because you're getting paid to have sex. Like to me, it's all the same. And there is study after study after study that tells us that pornography changes the way that men and women see and relate to each other. That the Very more so. pornography that you're exposed to, uh, the more, um, oh, I want to be really careful with my words here, but you look for something even more, I, I, I don't want to use the word depraved because I don't want to sound like mean to people who have porn addiction because I, what is it like 70% of men have porn addiction or something like that? It's, I, I think it's larger than that, but again, it's, I don't memorize stats and numbers, but yeah, it's something really high like that. It's like most men basically are, have a problem with porn and then a growing number of women do. Right. Right. And then it says, oh, well, because I watch women in porn doing these acts and I'm trying to be careful. I don't know what's going to get me kicked off of Facebook. So I don't know, like, I'm trying to be careful how much, how graphic I am. But like I see them behaving this way towards women. And so I think that that translates into real life sex with a woman. Like I think Absolutely. a real woman wants to be treated that way. Right. And it's actually super terrifying as a mother of daughters because I have to say what is going to eventually happen to my daughters, right? If, if they are dating a man and get married to a man or whatever who has a porn addiction and he's expecting to be able to choke and gag and electrocute and all of these horrific things that are happening in today's pornography. It's just, it's terrifying as a, as a parent to think about that. Well, and would you, you shared a story with me, um, a survivor that you've worked with who, um, and f forgive me, feel free to correct me if I get the story wrong. Uh, but if I recall correctly, she was being trafficked in Nevada and that if they didn't get their, um, make their quota for the night, that their punishment was that they were sent to the legal brothels in the Nevada. The legal brothels. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was their punishment. Yeah. So you it, can look up there. There are two women, they're survivors. Um, and, um, I do 
uh, I have worked with them and know them as acquaintances. Um, I know them because they're much bigger in the industry. They probably would not know me, remember yeah. me, but their names are Rebecca Bender and Rebecca Charleston. And they were both trafficked through the legal, um, the legal avenue in Nevada. And yet they are both, they both talk about their trafficking situation, the, the amount of abuse that they, you know, endured, the amount of uh, control that their trafficker had and how exactly how you just said they were, uh, they tell stories about how if they hadn't met the quota that their trafficker was expecting that as a punishment, he would send them to the legal brothels and that it was much more traumatizing at the legal brothels wow. and the legal brothels in their words are still being run by traffickers. Um, it's just so wait, crazy. what? Wait, yeah, they're, say that yeah, again. they're still being run by uh, again, according to, um, you know, their story. I, I, this is not. So uh, wait, no way. Hold on, Bethany. So what you're telling me is that it's not good upstanding citizens running brothels, that it's not like your grandma down the street. It's just it like that's what I feel like I've heard this with the drug conversation, too, that when you legalize marijuana, as an example, you're not getting, you know, Joe Schmo, your neighbor down the street opening a store. You're getting drug dealers and traffickers and people who are already engaged in nefarious activities, because how else would they already know how to do all that stuff? Uh, so oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted. It just like, of course. No, yes. Yes. Of course. You're okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Please it's, continue. It's not mom and pop. Um, it's not mom and pop who are, are running these brothels. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so the, the, one of the arguments is, and this is when you, when you told me that it was one of the things that sort of just was like, what, how, because you think one of the arguments, okay. For legalizing prostitution is that you know, you take it out of the darkness and you put it into the light, right? Like, you know, instead of it being underground, you can start dealing with the, the, the shame and the, and all of that stuff. Right. And then women or men who are being trafficked or whatever, instead of fearing prosecution, they'll come forward and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the experience of all the people that you've worked with. It sounds like even though in Nevada it was legal and they could have come forward about the abuse they were receiving in the brothels, they didn't. Correct. Yeah, they st they still aren't coming forward. There's there's so many facets from survivors that that you know have given testimony um, about their years stuck in trafficking, um, about the the coercion and the um, even the oh, I'm blanking on the name um, the syndrome. Where, Stockholm syndrome. Yeah, Stockholm syndrome. Um, you know how even Stockholm syndrome sets in for some of these women. You know they they a lot of these um, girls and women are coming. And I know I spoke to you about this in our pre kind of interview um, a month ago or whatever. But um, a, a lot of a lot of people that end up being trafficked or sexually exploited in any way are often in that situation out of um, their own life's vulnerabilities. Mm. Maybe they were a child of the foster care system. Maybe mm. they were a child that was sexually abused for much of their childhood. Maybe they were a child that just, um, maybe it wasn't uh, as, uh, as tragic, but maybe they were just um, the children of the product of um, a family who was broken up through divorce. Um, there, you know, I know a couple of survivors who it was, it was literally that simple. It was just their parents divorce. And in that divorce, it caused, you know, a breakdown in their family and shuffling back and forth and stuff like that. But m many of them, it's much more uh, severe than that. It comes mm -hmm. from childhood, uh, par parental, uh, uh, drug addiction and substance abuse and sexual assault and things like that. And so, you have these people that are already coming from a very vulnerable place in life where they've already endured so much trauma. It's really easy for a trafficker and for somebody who wants to exploit another human being to exploit them again, because there's brokenness and we all yeah. have, you know, brokenness in us to, to some degree. Right. Yeah. But the level of brokenness in somebody who's been sexually abused from the time they're three until they're seven or 10 or whatever is very different than, you know, my my trauma of, you know, my parents 
kind of raised me as a latchkey kid and I just got to run, you know, run around on my own in the seventies. Right. Like, right. I mean, yeah, some bad things happened to me, but that's very different than being sexually abused or having parents that, you know, um, burned me with cigarettes and, and stole my piggy bank money to get more drugs. Right. There's a vulnerability that happens in that kind of scenario that makes you very vulnerable to future things. And, so anyhow, there's just, yeah. in general, it's not just women and men and children who are, well, let's exclude children from that, who are just, you know, very emotionally stable, very emotionally grounded, without vulnerabilities, who are walking into these situations. So then in order to, if you're coming from that kind of vulnerability, and now you've been exploited, um, it's very, it, it's very hard for them to say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not at fault here. Yeah. Many of them come out and uh, who, who come out and talk later will say, I thought I was to blame. I thought I caused this to happen. I, it, this was all my fault. Yeah. And they, so they self loathe and they self blame and, you know, and a, a trafficker, an exploiter is perfectly willing to continue exploiting even something yep, like and that. And take advantage of that. Yeah. And yeah. isn't it, um, it is the highest uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking is, is it the highest grossing uh, illegal activity now, or it's, it's, it's quickly overtaking. It, it's quickly rising. I honestly don't know if it has hit the highest yet or not, but it's up know, there. Yeah. It, it's a, uh, it's, yeah. It's multi-billion dollar um, industry. Again, I, I hate using numbers. I mean, the numbers that you hear range from 32 billion to 50 to, I think I've even heard a hundred, which is why I hate giving numbers because it, it's honestly- <laughs> Depends so on where really, you read it. Yeah. It's just really hard to track that kind of stuff and to know, and from one agency to another, you know, federal agency and from one private organization, nonprofit to another, the numbers just vary, but it, it's an incredibly profitable. If it's not the first, it's the second. It used to be the third. I think it's not the third anymore. Yeah, I, I seem to recall because everything that I've heard about it, you know, it's this idea like you can only sell drugs one time. If I have a kilo of cocaine, I right. can only sell that one time, but I can sell a person over and over, over and, and over, over and again. over again. And right. we have, especially in, you know, where we are today, there's so many broken homes. We are lacking in community, especially now with the last year with the depression and the drug abuse and the drug overdose. We've seen an epidemic of heroin addiction um, and all kinds of addictions across this country. And so you have to just go, okay, well, it that makes people even more vulnerable. So you have all these people who are clearly miserable and depressed and lost. And, you know, we're seeing skyrocketing overdoses and suicides. And so you just go, there's so many more people now who are going to be vulnerable to this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had two sex trafficking rings busted in Burlington. One of them was people bringing heroin addicted girls, women to places like New York city to be sold. And you just go. So even in our little tiny state, now I know you're from New Hampshire, Bethany, but in our little state of Vermont, we have bad people knowing, you know, six hours away in New York city, four hours away in Springfield mass or wherever it is, they know they can come and find girls that they can take advantage of. There's yeah. actually drug dealers. And this is, if you talk to police officers in Burlington, they'll tell you this. Uh, they're not allowed to really talk about it in public, right? But it's happening. Uh, these men will come from places like New York or Massachusetts or wherever. They're criminals, drug dealers or, or traffickers or whatever. They'll come, they'll make friends and manipulate some woman here. And then they'll move into her apartment and then rope her into helping them with this whole process. And it's actually a really big problem. And so you're seeing 
out of state men come here to take and to come to Vermont to take advantage of our, our vulnerable people. And, and we're not allowed to talk about that because of the color, the, the skin color of the people who are committing these crimes. Because if you say that, then you're a racist. You're not allowed to just tell the truth about what's happening and how unfortunate and sucky it is. Um, but it's also like if you care so much about people of color and people that are vulnerable, they're also being taken advantage of and trafficked. Well, uh, among trafficked individuals, um, black 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 Americans, uh, you know, um, make up the majority of that. Blacks and then Hispanics make up the majority. Of and the majority is not white. Of, um, of, of people being trafficked? People being trafficked, yeah. So there's some really just horrific uh, documentaries done by a really brilliant doctor um, out in Colorado, I think it was. And I do not remember the names of the documentaries, but I could I could try to find it for you and, and email it to you. That'd be um, awesome. It's it's horrifically sad and awful to watch. But she's a black doctor um, and she I think she's like a psychologist or something. And this is what she's done is made her life study um, uh, or her life's work rather um, about the, you know, the epidemic of um, black people being trafficked. And wow. um, and it's it's just it's really sad. So, yeah, it, it's people of other ethnic groups other than whites. And obviously whites are trafficked as well. Um, and um, but, yeah, it overwhelmingly is uh, blacks and Hispanics. That in our is, in our country, well, and especially if you think about, I wonder, and you may not know the answer to this, but are illegal immigrants more likely to be trafficked than legal immigrants? Like, if we're talking about just strictly Hispanic people, do you yeah. know? Um, so I can I, I cannot answer that okay. uh, with dif with a, a definitive answer. But what I can say is, it it's very likely because they're coming from a place of vulnerability. Even again, even if they've never um, been raised in a bad home, if they've never been sexually abused at all as a child, but they're, they're not coming gonna... into a country where they don't know the language, they don't have a job, they don't have anything. And now they're being told, hey, you know, I have a modeling company. Why don't you come and model for me? Or, hey, oh uh, you know, you can sell. There is, um, the is, I don't know if it's still current, but, um, some of those mall kiosks where they have the people standing in the middle um, wanting to do your nails and sell um, lotions and stuff it, um, that that had been a trafficking ring. Not again, I'm not saying all across our whole country, Obviously. but at, at, at some level, at some point that had been a trafficking ring. And so you, if, if you ever paid attention, if you knew this and you ever paid attention and you went to the mall and you got, you know, um, pursued by somebody at one of those little kiosks, they were all people from other countries. They were never English speaking Americans that were working at these. And so, you know, there were several busts on, on these uh, little kiosks or really the, you know, the larger organization yeah. because they were finding out that, you know, that these were uh, labor trafficking uh, rings. So well, and that's one of the tra the sex trafficking rings in the Burlington area that got broken up was Asian people. So they were bringing women over. I don't remember if it was China specifically or Vietnam or if it was just you know that part of Asia. I I don't remember exactly, but it was Asian people, um, and it was that they were. Oh, you know, come to America. You know, we're gonna give you a job and everything is gonna be great. And then you get here on this visa. And you're dependent on these people. And they're like, just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that was the only, um, when I first started doing this uh, work, I had talked to the attorney general, the assistant attorney general of New Hampshire. And I asked them, I said, why didn't you guys traffic, or why didn't you charge my neighbor with trafficking? And they said, he was very clear, which is why I work and do a lot of, a lot of legislative stuff uh, here in New Hampshire and why I'm help, trying to help Vermont uh, on this particular bill. Um, but they said, because uh, in New Hampshire, we just don't have strong enough laws uh, to, 
to get him put behind bars for as long as we think he needs to be put behind bars. And he said, so basically there's more than one way to skin a cat. And so what they did is instead of charging him on trafficking laws, they charged him on every single time he uploaded a uh, child porn mm. to the web. And what that allowed uh, what that allowed them to do was to charge him for hundreds of counts of child porn, producing child porn, uploading child porn. And so he's spending 40 life sentences in prison now, wow. which is fantastic, right? He deserves Good. that. But Death we penalty. couldn't have gotten that. The, the attorney general, the prosecutors could not have gotten that under New Hampshire's laws at that time. And so the laws at that time had only ever prosecuted one case of trafficking, and it was an apple farm. You know, apple picking is huge up here in New England. I don't know if it is elsewhere, but it certainly is here in New England. And so we had these big apple farms, and this married couple, white couple, was, you know, upstanding community members, huge, huge apple farm, very well-known apple farm. And they went down to Jamaica, and they said, hey, we're trying to hire, you know, some guys to come in and help us run our apple farm in the fall. And they had some guys and they said, you can send money back to your family. They got these three men up here and immediately took their passports from them, which is a, a known trafficking, um, like, uh, it's in the it's in the playbook, right? It's like yeah. get them get them here, take their passports, Make them vulnerable. and then they can't leave. And yep. you know, so they did. They took their passports, and then after they took their passports, they made them live in a little shed in their in the back of the apple farm. They deadbolted them into the shed every night. They made they didn't give them bedding or blankets or anything. They just gave them hay to sleep on. And it's New England in the fall, so it's cold at night, and you have these poor men. So finally they dug a hole through the bottom and one of them found enough courage to like break through the hole, crawl under the shed and run to the street. That's the only prosecuted case we've ever had or at that time had ever had in, in New Hampshire because our laws just were not that's solid crazy. enough. So that's why I try to encourage people, find out what laws you have on the books in your state. And if you're not satisfied with them, yep. start talking Do to something. your senator, start talking yep. to your representatives, start making change, offer ideas like the age of consent. We just changed in New Hampshire, the age of consent. It's a stepping stone. It's still horrific. But our age of consent as of last legislative session was 13, which means what? that if a, if a child had been coerced into saying yes, and that yes could legally be counted as, well, she said yes, at the age of 13, still a baby, they now are legally not allowed to prosecute because that was, that was the legal age of consent. We That's just wild. got it changed barely, barely to age 15. And for us, that was a win, but it's not a win, we just know that it's a stepping stone that, okay, it's 15 right. now, maybe in a couple more years, we can get it to 17, but we had to start somewhere because well, the law, our laws were so awful. Well, and California just lowered the age of consent. I know it's sickening. I, I, I remember hearing that and being like, what? Yeah. By the same person who said that if you are knowingly infecting people with HIV, you can't be prosecuted for it yep. as a, uh, uh, murder. Yeah. So the same legislature legislator said, you know, you can knowingly infect people with HIV and it's not murder. And Oh, by the way, you can have sex with a 13 year old. Yep. I, I just, it boggles the mind. It and does. actually it absolutely it, does. And speaking of California, actually, this is a, you mentioned something earlier, you know, that, um, the advertisement for a modeling agency, uh, my husband and I lived in Los Angeles for a couple of years and um, we would go through like Craigslist and, you know, some other stuff. He's a filmmaker, actor, stunt man. And I was looking for opportunities to get involved in the film industry as well. And so I can't tell you how many of those advertisements were there and how many stories I heard from people that we were friends with who showed up to something that they thought was a gig and it wasn't, it was just a porn or it was somebody trying to take advantage of them or whatever. Yeah. And so in, especially in a place like California or Los Angeles, where you have, again, you have a bunch of vulnerable people, right? So 
you everybody goes out to LA to be famous and to get their break and you know whatever and so and it's expensive as all get out to live there so if you're a young woman who wants to make it in Hollywood and you're broke and you've got nothing you know and then you show up to something that you think is a modeling gig and it's like nope we're going to, you know, oh, it's a porn. And then you go, well, you know, what else am I going to do? I'm broke. I need to eat. I need to eat. I need to pay my rent, you know, whatever. And, you know, I remember. Yeah, LA is the largest producer of pornography in the world. In the in, world? In, yeah, in LA. <clears throat> so it's, it's crazy um, where, you know, I, so yeah. Anyhow, it's just cra it's crazy. Um, that is wild. Well, and, and that, isn't and that it kind of thing does happen right all the time? Um, girls and show up to these, you know, these what seem like legitimate ads to only be duped into something else. Um, but that happens even within the porn industry. I worked mm. with a survivor, beautiful woman, beautiful survivor, um, and she had been. Um, she willingly walked into a porn, uh, you know, the porn industry. She walked into a company, a well-known porn producing company, and um, she knew exactly what she was doing. She was okay with it. And she walked in and she signed the contract. And in, within the contract, she had to say, you know, these are the things I'm okay doing. And these are the things I'm not okay doing. And so she writes down the list of things that she was not okay with doing, which were scenes of gang rape, scenes, scenes of double and triple penetration and things like that. And she wrote, you know, wrote those down. The ink wasn't even dry on her contract and she's already performing her first scene. And within the very first scene, many of the things that she said she did not want to happen to her were being ha or were being done to her. She was being hit and abused. She was being gang raped all within the very first day of, of her contracted work with this porn company. And she talks about the trauma that, 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 you know, caused that, that day caused her. And so um, she That's... said that she did, she ended up going home that day. She had, you know, she had, um, I believe she had tried substance abuse at some point or, you know, sub substances, um, but it was not, did not have an addiction. And she said she did go home and, and, uh, you know, drown her yeah, trauma. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what, it's one of those things where, you know, the human psyche is so funny, right? So you have this thing happen to you, right? And, and, and it, you go in willfully and you say, well, I agreed to it, you know, and then I didn't stop it or I didn't run away. And therefore, uh, I'm it's blame. my fault. It's my fault. Um, you know, I, you know, I shouldn't have walked in there in the first place. And so, well, you know, and then you try to tell yourself that it's not really rape or, you know, whatever. And you try to rationalize your brain around the trauma so that you can kind of put it in a box and deal with it, right? Yes, right. And that's often where the drug abuse, addictions, self-harm start, A, right? And then B, yeah. and then you go, well, guess I'm already damaged and screwed up anyway, so I might as well just go back and do it again. Yeah, yep. And right. you hear that so much. You know, it's like, I feel like I hear, and here's the thing, Bethany, so this is, this is what, this is one of the things that I was wrestling with when I was thinking about this and doing the research. I go, okay, we hear the horror stories, right? We hear all the bad things that happen. We hear the survivors talk about this stuff that happens. You don't, you don't hear a lot of women. Maybe I don't, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just not looking in the right places who are like, you know what? I feel super empowered by this and this is me taking ownership of my body. And this is, you know, I grew up in a perfectly stable home and everything was fine and therefore, you know, whatever. So is it the, the women who are in it willfully without these emotional issues, are they just not talking about it? Are they just not advocating for legalization of prostitution? What do you, why do you think that is that, 
are, do they, are there just not enough of them or do they just like to keep their nose clean? <laughs> um, oh, I mean, I can't really speak for any of them, you know, straight out. Right. Um, but uh, I can say that statistically speaking, there are far, far, far fewer of them than there are of those that are being exploited. Mm -hmm. um, just, yeah. I mean, we have thousands, thousands that collectively all the organizations across the country uh, have worked with and, uh, you know, and continue to pull survivors out of situations um, where we know that, that that just isn't the case for the majority. Yeah. So you're really looking at a minority number um, yeah. in that kind of situation. Well, and that's um, even Jay said, I said, you know, can you give me an estimate? Did I say, if I said this earlier, forgive me, but I said, uh, what percentage of people that you worked with were sober and healthy like you versus the people that were drug addicted and, and committed suicide. And she said, she said, you know, honestly, I can't tell you that I, I wouldn't know, but she said there's far fewer of me than there are of them. Yeah. She did say that. And right. I'm sorry if I interrupted you, please. If you were going to say something. No, I, I can't remember now. <laughs> okay. All right. So this Mom is just, life. Oh my God. It's just mind boggling. This is just a mind boggling conversation. So yeah. So One I really the... want to talk to the whole empowering thing. Oh, yeah, um, please. Because it, this bill that's trying to pass, not just in Vermont, but I think it's at last legislative session nationally. I think there were 15 states trying to yes. pass this, this yeah. law. Um, New Hampshire tried passing it for three legislative sessions, and they kind of left New Hampshire. And we think uh, what they did was they kind of said, hey, there's there's a small but fierce number of people in New Hampshire that are fighting this. Um, let's go to Vermont. Everything passes in Vermont. And <laughs> once it passes in Vermont, then it will be really easy to pass in oh. New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts. And so we really think that's that that's amazing. kind of what their plan is. There is a small group of pro-prostitution women, women that are um, maybe like your friend Jay, who are you know, very much on board. This is what I want to do for a living. And so mm -hmm. they're paying, they're either paying by force, fraud or coercion, those women to come along and testify, or those women are truly like your friend and truly believe that this should be legalized and they're coming mm -hmm. along and, and testifying. But there's a lot of money backing these bills. Um, and a, <laughs> a lot of these small nonprofits like myself and many others just don't have the financial means to back this. Oh, so wait, you mean trafficking cartels might have a vested interest in getting some people to go testify to the legislature on their behalf? Yeah, and maybe not quoting anybody but maybe possibly the pro marijuana group oh my god okay all right i'm yeah. sorry i interrupted you again bethany please continue please continue so um oh what was i saying though so we oh. have so um, whether so there there's some women they're coming and testifying oh right. that they're for so, it thank you yeah so you have um you know a, a a small handful of women that that you know believe that this is empowering but the problem is is that uh, on the opposite side of this bill, the opposite side of where I stand, is that the 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 argument is that this is empowering to women to be able to sell their bodies and to be able to do what they want with their bodies. The problem with that argument and why it is so fundamentally flawed is because what we've already talked about is the fact that the number of women and children and men and people in the LGBT community and stuff like that, the number of those people that are being exploited who are, are doing this on their own and they're perfectly healthy and they are, they're, they're not, right. You can't have yeah. exploited and perfectly healthy doing this on their own. And so if you're being exploited, which we know is the vast majority of these people that are that are being prostituted and put into pornography and sold online and all this different kind of stuff. If you're being exploited, how how on earth can that be empowering when yeah. one man is controlling you and your body because he has purchased you with his with his dollars? 
that's not empowering on any level. That's not empowering for women, for men, for people in the LGBT community, people of different ethnic groups. That is not empowering. And, the, and that's why it's so fundamentally flawed and why I feel so passionate about it is because the other side really wants to have people believe that this is empowering for people, yeah. but they're missing the fact that the majority of the people, the majority, I'm not talking about your friend Jay, I'm talking about the vast majority of the people that are being bought and sold are people who are being exploited, people yeah. that are being trafficked or sexually exploited in some way for some reason or another. Maybe they need drug money, maybe whatever it is, but they're being exploited. And at the end of the day, the core of that exploitation is not empowering. Yeah. It leads to death and suicide. It leads to mental mental health issues. It leads to trauma. It leads to years of counseling if they should ever get out. There's no there's nothing empowering about that. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things I find super funny about I want to be careful because I we're having a really deep thoughtful conversation and I hate to turn it to the actual bill itself and how stupid our legislators are framing this. And I, I'm not supposed to talk like that about people, but when I read the bill, if I, hold on, I'm going to share my screen here. I read the bill and it talks about, um, you know, it says here, the uh, majority of Vermont laws on prostitution were adopted more than a hundred years ago. And it was to prosecute black men in relationships with white women, which is just an absolute lie. It is, it is a 100% a lie. W did that happen? Possibly, potentially. I'm not saying that it didn't, but this idea that, that laws against prostitution. Oops. I didn't realize that I hadn't shared my screen yet. There we go. So that the laws against prostitution were actually pushed forward uh, by feminists, by the suffragettes. So they knew, if you look up historically, um, so yes, yeah, so this bill says that um, it, the reason for the prostitution laws was because uh, they wanted to, to prosecute black men for ha or, uh, men of color for having relationships with white women. And that this is uh, to fight white slave traffic, which is just a disgusting and irresponsible and dishonest characterization of why prostitution laws came into being in this country. So when we, so back in the day, right, like the 18th century or whatever it is. Wow, that is really skipping this one. Um, when women were fighting more for their rights and for the right to vote and to be treated better uh, in regard to the law, they actually railed against prostitution because they saw that men or they were experiencing men treating them as uh, as objects. And so excuse me, iTunes needs your attention. Oh, I'm sorry. That was mine. I had to oh. plug my phone in. It's about ready to die. <laughs> <laughs> so my computer's now talking to me. <laughs> okay. I was like, wait, where did that come from? <laughs> um, so you had, so this, so, so, right. So the early feminists, we'll call them the suffragettes, right? So the suffragettes fought against prostitution to have it made illegal so that men would be more respectful. So it, to increase their status in society so that they wouldn't just be treated as objects and basically slaves uh, or, you know, being used and abused. Right. And now our current day feminists are saying, we'll call them feminists, right? So suffragettes, feminists are saying that it's empowering to be able to sell yourself as a commodity. And I think, like, we're talking about the same exact topic. And these women said, we want it to be illegal because we're being mistreated. And these women are saying, we want it to be legal so we can do what we want with our bodies and be empowered. How 
I can't even reconcile that in my brain. How can the same topic have a, have that differentiation like that? It's yeah. I mean, we, I think many of us within this industry fighting against this struggle with the same, you know, the same question. It's, it's, yeah. it's crazy to think um, that the opposing side thinks that this is empowering for women. It's, it's not on any level empowering for women. I laughed so hard. I had this moment because I've always thought of myself. I had always thought of myself as a feminist, always had thought of myself as a feminist. And then one day I remember I was thinking about this kind of topic, this stuff. And I realized th that women have absolutely been bamboozled and I'm sure I'm going to get crap for this, but uh, who's the guy, the, the guy that started Hustler? Um, Larry Flint? Yeah. La I think it's Larry Flint, right? He was yep. the guy who did yep. Hustler and he went he through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he went through the Supreme Court and all this stuff and that it was free speech and that it was empowering and right. And this is like women, we're empowered and we're going to burn our bras. And we're going to run around with our shirt off and we're going to have sex with whoever we want. And we're going to, you know, have abortion so we don't have to worry about pregnancy. And we're going to do it. And I go, that's you saying that you're empowered, but that's actually just you giving men exactly what they want without the responsibility of the natural outcome of the act. Yep. <laughs> I go, I was like, we're so dumb. Oh my God. Like why? Like that is not empowering. That is not empowering. We're just get, we're literally just, you know, I remember hearing all these expressions like, why buy the cow when you can have the milk for free and stuff like that. And I just remember thinking like, oh, whatever, you know, because I was young and I bought the lie, you know, oh, promiscuous sex makes me super empowered. And oh, look at me. And it's like, I'm not manipulating guys. I'm not getting what I want. I'm just giving them what they want. And what am I getting out of it? Like a few minutes of pleasure. Great. What good does that do me? Yeah. Which, by the way, is not what women that are being trafficked, women and children, men, that they're not even getting that. No. And that's so you're like, it's, I feel like the foundation of this conversation is a lie, right? The foundation for the legalization of prostitution, the foundation for you know, all of this stuff saying that it's okay and that we should just be able to have whatever transactional relationship with we want with whoever, it takes away the reality of the intimacy of the act of sex. And, and when we have a culture that doesn't value the human body and it doesn't value our san the sanctity of the human being itself right like our culture does not value the sanctity of human life it doesn't right. no right in it doesn't form. in any form we it doesn't matter you're just a a clump of cells whether you're an unborn baby or you're a human being you, you know the soul doesn't matter and you know we're just here to you know FOMO and FOLO or whatever all those stupid acronyms are, you know, just go live your life and have fun and everything is great, right? This idea that there is no consequence for those behaviors. And I think that that dehumanization of the human being and the human spirit to begin with is what sort of allows us to arrive at this place where we can just use people and abuse people. Yeah, very much so. Hmm, that's a great note to end on. Um, <laughs> you know, so and let, I, me, let me, uh, let me talk yeah, about go ahead. the bill then. Yeah. Yeah. Quickly. Yeah. So the bill is, um, 
Well, in last legislative session, it was House Bill 568 and 569. 568 Mm -hmm. was a study bill. Well, it was a bill to to do a study on what, you know, what are the ramifications of legalizing prostitution and fully decriminalizing it. 569 was the full legalization and decriminalization of prostitution in Mm -hmm. Vermont. So that we know of so far, um, the second bill has not been introduced. That doesn't mean that it isn't going mm-hmm. to be, and it doesn't mean yeah. that it it isn't somewhere on somebody's docket. I'm not um, super familiar with how all of this works. Um, yeah. But we do know that 568, and I, I think it might have, it's a different number now. Um, I, generally from session to session, if it didn't pass, it, it gets a different number. Um, but we do know that that study bill is back out and um, mm. it will be voted on. Yep. And so this study bill, that's typically if if a bill happens <laughs> to be particularly egregious, they will throw a study bill in front of it and they'll say, we're just going to study it. It's just we're going to look and see how it goes and everything. But the full intention is that the study is is going to go in the favor of the direction that they wanted to go in anyway. And that's exactly yep. what we see and know of, of House Bill 568, because we yep. know that some of the people who are already on the committee for the study bill are like the head of the ACLU and the head of the LGBT community in Vermont. Yep. And there are people who, um, uh, you know, have an agenda to see this pass for, for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. And so, we know that the study bill um, is, uh, unless there's just fierce, fierce um, opposition. Yeah, opposition. We know that the study bill will pass, and yep. and what will be so tragic about its passing is that it really, the entire intent was really just to pave the way for to the pass bill. Five sixty nine. Yes. So that's we saw that with cannabis. We saw that with tons of other bills. Yeah. We, so uh, yes. If, if we see, if we allow 568 to get passed in Vermont, if we don't rise up and, and, and raise our voices in opposition of 568, 569 will pass almost definitely. So yeah. as Vermonters, and I'm not a Vermonter, um, but I've been working for the last year and a half, year and a quarter, year and a half to help Vermonters not pass these bills. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And so as, this year, this year it's House Bill 268. So anybody who's listening, if you, this is the, this is the bill to do the study, right? And so I would be, I would almost support decriminalization of prostitution. I would almost support that as long as we didn't then create a marketplace and do all that other stuff, because I want people to feel safe coming forward and asking for help without the fear of be of going to jail. The so problem I, with fully legalizing and decriminalizing. Yeah. Even yeah. if you're even if you're somewhat on board for it for women, mm-hmm. the problem is is that in the in this bill, 569, it legalizes every single aspect of prostitution. So it legalizes um legal brothels in your tiny little neighborhood. Say you live on the same cul-de-sac street that I live on, right? Seven houses, eight houses. My next door neighbor could be running a legal brothel while my six kids are running around in my backyard playing and having a good time. Dude, you can't even have a strip club in Vermont. Right. You can't even have a strip club and we're going to have brothels? Right. And all of that would be legal. So you'll have legal street walking. You'll have oh um, all of this kind of stuff. So in, in Nevada, what we know, what we see, what we know is going on is that you have state legislators that are are pimps totally legal they're now running so nevada has a um a parade every year and guess who's allowed to be in the parade the pimps with all of his prostitutes scantily clad sitting on the top of the convertible do you know what else is also legal in nevada which will be legal in vermont if if these bills pass if your child has career day, guess who's legally allowed to go to your child's elementary school and tout tout his career? Pimps. It will be fully legal to be able to go to the elementary school or the high school, junior high, and say, 
hey, this is what I do for a living. And, you know, and we need some new people. And, and they, that's literally what's happening in Nevada. They're, they're recruiting from the schools when career day happens. All of the, like every aspect of prostitution becomes legalized. It's like people just don't understand the full ramifications of what full legalization and full decriminalization does. Oh my We're God. only going to talk about from the other side how empowering it is for women. We're not going to tell them all of the really bad negative things that will come along with that. Oh my God. Because this is making my that? brain hurt. Oh my God. Uh, Olga said homeschool. <laughs> Yes. Uh, but yeah, that for a lot of reasons, homeschool. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> oh my God. This is just making my brain hurt. Oh my God. Okay. And this is the thing. This is, I, I got so angry. I can't remember if it was this, it was this last summer. The ACLU of Vermont came out with a, st a, a report or their recommendations. And they said in order to address the, um, uh, the, the representation in our prison system of people of color. So in order to deal with the fact that we have a disproportionate number of black people or uh, not white people in prison in Vermont, that we needed to decriminalize writing bad checks, uh, trespassing. Um, there was a bunch of other stuff and uh, sex work, decriminalized sex work. And I said, I said, Oh, so the ACLU doesn't think black people can get along in the state of Vermont unless they can steal, uh, trespass, and be pimps and hoes. And I just remember being so angry reading it and thinking to myself, this is some of the most racist stuff I have ever read in my entire life. But we can't the, call it racism. I, what else is it if you say that black I people know. can't get by in Vermont unless they can commit I know. crimes? I know. It's it's tragic. It's tragic. It, it makes me... Th see, this is why, like... <sighs> I believe they can. I believe black people are better than crime and prostitution and... and you know, all that stuff, but it is, it is an incredibly like, racist thing to say that you can't it, get by unless, unless all these things are happening. And that's what, like, they can't be doctor. Like my husband, my husband is a filmmaker, but in Vermont, I guess he needs to be able to be a pimp or steal from people in order to get by. And it's like, right. why would you say that about right. people? Right. You know, and now you're saying that like, prostitution laws are racist and that's why we're going to overturn them. I would, I, I wouldn't be as offended by this bill if it didn't start by saying this is racist. Yeah. You know, and then you just go, it's just more and more of this stuff. And then I'm hearing you talk about what the experience is for places like Rhode Island and Nevada where they're, you know, they're showing up to career day and they're going on, uh, parades and the crime rises and all this other stuff. And you just say to yourself, what, what is the percentage? And I know you, I'm sure you don't know the answer to this, but it's a rhetorical question. What is the percentage of people who are helped by legalizing prostitution versus the number of people who are harmed by legalizing prostitution? So, I don't, I know that that was a rhetorical question, but it, it prompted something in my brain Yeah. Um, to say that another, another negative aspect of, of these bills is that currently as the bills are written, it takes away um, exit strategies for, for people that are being sexually exploited and trafficked. Um, it, it, it lessens the amount of money that goes towards women um, and, oh. and children and men who are who are trying to leave and trying to get out. Um, there are just less exit strategies. Those of us fighting um, for an alternative method for um, 
for uh, bill, you know, there, there's a handful of bills and I don't want to name them or not bills. There's a handful of models and I don't want to name them because there's, there's several of them out there right now. Um, but they're, they're models being drawn up and made by survivors and by people who are working to protect people, you know, to protect people that are being prostituted and exploited. And in those, in those models, there's a tremendous amount of exit strategy services um, or exit exit services for people that are trying to leave and get out of the game, get out of the life, get out, uh, you know, for their life. Any any words you want to use and put in there, but there's a tremendous amount of exit strategies. What you'll notice in these bills, there isn't that. It's, yeah. They don't really care about the exit no. strategies. It's like, it, it's not even a thought for them no. at all because it's very empowering for women. So why would we need exit? <laughs> it's crazy. It's really sad. It's really sad. Okay. Wait, I need a second to, okay, hold on. I got to collect myself. That's ridiculous. Okay. So just really curious though, why don't you want to name the models? You well, said there's I mean, things being drawn up. Yeah, I mean, I can. Like, one is called the equality equality model. There's just there's so many, and there and the the variations in them are okay. My new, but not not everybody within our industry, the anti trafficking movement, we just haven't all settled on one model. Uh, so I okay, just, I, you know, I don't want to like, but whatever. So okay, so there's not like not, you're trying to protect people or protect no, the no, no, outcome no. or it's something just, like it's that. Not settled oh, okay. on which model is the best. There's the Nordic I model, see. the Swedish model, the equality model, the uh, something act now model or something like that. Yeah. I forget another one, but there are several and they're all pretty similar, but there's just, there's minutia within each one that's slightly different. And, yeah. and just as an industry, we haven't settled on it. And I kind of wish we would, but you know, it, it's, there's a good and a bad that 12 years ago when I was doing this, there weren't many people doing this. Oh my God. And in the 12 years that I've been doing it, we, there's a huge influx of passionate people that care deeply about this um, globally and even, you know, here in the United States. And with that passion comes a lot of really brilliant minds and a lot of minds mm -hmm. that want to see really beautiful and positive change. Yeah. But you have a pocket of minds over here and a pocket of minds, you know, like the Swedish and then the Norwegian and then the, you know, so it's just, yeah. They're good um, models. They're just not, you know, there's, there's minutia and change in, in each one. Nothing yes. bad. No, that makes sense. Okay. So, um, okay. This is so funny. So when, okay. Olga said, when are public hearings on this study bill? We need Bethany. You don't happen to know when they're, if, if they've scheduled a hearing for this yet, do you? I don't think so. My contact in, um, in Vermont, her name is Maggie. Um, she usually lets me know when when hearings on bills like this are coming up, and yeah. I haven't heard from her. Okay, um, but we do have. Um, I I work with um, a, a really really incredible organization called the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. They're okay. out of Washington D.C., but they have members that are in New England. And so, um, and uh, we've created a New England-based um, organization called uh, Nice New Englanders Against Sexual Exploitation, um, and you can you can you know go to either one of those websites. And so, within New England, we have um, chairs from each state um, who represent each one of those states, and then we have um, lobbyists and and activists um, from each state as well that um, that are that belong to Nice, and so. Um, one of the women who um, is a brilliant mind in in working for the National Center on Sexual Ex Se Sexual Exploitation, she um, lives in Connecticut and has connections in Connecticut, and so she's going to be able to testify at the hearing um, in in Vermont, um, which she, she really is the one who should be testifying. She's a brilliant mind. She's um, yeah, she's her name's Eleanor, and she's brilliant. That's amazing. So yeah, she's I just a so policy you, writer for the for Nicosi. I'm going to connect you with Olga because she says I want to have biweekly talk with her to learn how to hand help. Uh, you know, her mind is blown, and I really feel like uh, 
you know, it was my husband and I, I like, I don't, I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know that trafficking period sex or otherwise, I didn't even know it was a thing until we were at church one day and one of our church members, uh, do you remember the name of that organization? He worked for, we donated to them for a while. Uh, on a monthly basis, but he was working with the, the couple was working with this organization that was fighting trafficking. And, he, and it was like, I, there are so many people who don't even know this is happening, you know? And so yeah. when you said that you've been working on this for 12 years, and I think I just heard about it like four years ago, five, and I'm a pretty, and I would consider myself a pretty informed person like I'm pretty involved in politics and I pay attention and I watch the news and I read the paper and magazines yeah. and all that stuff. And I'm like, you've been at this for 12 years and I just heard about it like five minutes ago. Yeah. How is this not being blasted from speakers all over the place to help people? I mean, I think, and I know that's somewhat of a rhetorical question, but I think the truthful answer is because um, people don't want to talk about it, right? If it, we talked yeah. about earlier, the, the percentage of men and even growing number of women that are addicted to pornography, right? Now, yeah. if I try to do a, a conference and I have the title, anything to do with pornography, my attendance is way down in the gutter. I could have 30 mm. attendees. If I do a conversation and I title it, you know, mm. um, uh, protecting women and children from, from exploitation, not even, don't even say a sexual yeah. from just exploitation, you know, something like that. I don't, I don't use the word sex. I don't use the word porn. My attendance can be at, you know, a hundred, 200. Um, it, it's crazy. Even though literally my slide deck might be the exact same slides wow. and, and the information will be the same, but just getting people to come and have the conversation is just really challenging. And, it, and I think because there's so much um, at the core of the human being, there's so much shame and guilt mm -hmm. tied to um, pornography addiction. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You have those people that just truly don't care and they just, they really just see um, pornography and buying buying another human being for sexual gratification as a rite of passage, right? It's yeah. just the way of life. It is what you do. Yeah. But I really do believe that at the core of the human being, we know that innately that it is it's not right. And so there's there's a level of um, shame and a level level of mm. I don't want to be told what I'm doing is wrong. I don't mm. want to be. I don't want to mm. have to hear from some goody two shoe that this is, you know, wrong or whatever. Yeah. And so the conversation is really, really hard to get started. Yeah. Now you can start the conversation um, about trafficking a little bit easier um, because I think people, if they think about the movie Taken, right, it, which is such a, a horrific example of trafficking because mm -hmm. that's not what trafficking looks like in the United States at all. The, the most common form of trafficking now occurs in the United States in the in the form of uh, teenagers on social media. It is our teens on social media. It is um, our teenage children who have given full access to every pervert on the Internet to their account who now can private message them and tell them all kinds of lies. And they're, they're brilliantly minded people. Um, they're, they're dumb as heck, but they're brilliantly minded yep. in knowing know how, how to, to capture a vulnerable person. Yep. So they, they, they start talking to them in just casual conversation. Hey, what did you do today? You know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I got in a fight with my parents and then they latch on to that vulnerability. Yep. Well, what did you, what was the fight about? Oh yeah. That's so stupid. You know, if, if if you wanted a place to live, you can come and live here. I'll take care of you. I'll pay for all your things. It's as simple as that. And you have children wow. in good homes that are choosing to, you know, leave their home in the middle of the night to go meet up with a man that they've never met, who they think might be a 14-year-old boy. 
or a 13 year old girl, or maybe they even believe that it's a 21 year old man, but who's going to love them and protect them and not mm. have rules and not have boundaries. Yeah. And that the, in fact, that it's completely opposite. That person has nothing but ill intended, um, you know, has no nothing but ill, Ill, Ill intentions for that person. Yep. And so that is the most common form of, of trafficking that we see in America. It isn't the kidnapping off the street and abducting and, mm. and pushing into uh, sex rings. These kids are pushed into sex rings, but it is it, it starts through social media. Yep. That is the number one um, uh conference that I put on is teaching parents and children safe social media usage because it's just, it's terrifying. I'm so tempted to make so many jokes and snarky remarks right now, but it's so serious a topic. I feel like I, like, I'll just say it like in the, and we want to give these people the voting. We want them to vote. They eat Tide Pods. They make themselves like, these are, these are kids. They don't know what they're doing. They make terrible decisions. Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but when I was, I was a pretty good teenager. You know, I wasn't getting into all kinds of trouble. And I still look back sometimes and go, oh my God, how did I make it out alive? Yeah. How my friends, all the dumb stuff that we did. Yep. I oh think the God. same thing. And, and like you, I was in general, a fairly good kid. I didn't get into drugs or alcohol, but we went through this choking each other to pass out phase. And I'm like, gosh, that was so dangerous and horrible. Why did we do that? What are we doing? Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. And so right. it's like, so they just know, it's like you said, they're, they're terrible people. So you don't want to give them kudos for being smart, but you know, yeah, I've been in prison and I remember thinking to myself, um, you know, for people who don't know my story, you know, I'm a recovering addict and I got in trouble related to my drug addiction. So I spent some time in, in prison 15 years ago. And I just remember like if the women that I was in prison with took the ingenuity that they used to get contraband into the prison right. to do something good with their lives, our world would be a much different place. Mm -hmm. And because they do, they figure out how to manipulate people. They figure out the best ways to manipulate people and they go for it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, it has been so wonderful to talk to you, Bethany. It my has voice. just been an absolute delight. Thank you for sharing your experience and your stories and your information. There are tons and tons and tons of comments uh, and questions, people engaging in this conversation. So that is amazing. This is clearly something that really touches everyone. Um, this affects all of us, whether it's, you know, you who suddenly found out that your neighbor was doing this crazy thing, or it's our, uh, you know, our spouse or our, our friend that has a pornography addiction, or it's our uncle or aunt who is a drug addict and has become vulnerable. Like, these conversations affect all of us. And I think almost always when I'm talking to people about what is wrong with the world and how to fix it, the solution is be in community with one another, be responsible to your neighbors, be responsible to your family, to your siblings, to your, to your parents, to your cousins, to your neighbors, care about people. Get out of your house and knock on somebody's door and say hello. Well, I mean, that's kind of creepy considering what we're talking about right now. But you get my point. Like, <laughs> be in your community and show up for people and let them know that you care so that, you know, if somebody out there is being trafficked or is being exploited, they might just know one person who acted like they gave enough of a crap about them that they might just come to you for help. Yeah. Yeah. This oh. is kind of a totally off topic, but I watched this really beautiful video. Um, it's on YouTube of a, a young man who was going to commit suicide off the San Francisco bridge and the golden gate bridge. And he, he 
you know, was young, 18, I think at the time, and he was riding the bus and he was just crying the whole way there. And he, he just, he said, I didn't really believe in God, but I just was like saying, God, if anybody, if, if one person just shows that they care, then I won't do this. And he said, not one single person on the bus said a single thing like, son, are you okay? What, what's wrong? Are you hurting? And he said, in fact, two guys turned around and they were friends and they mocked me and they made fun of me. He said, so when the bus stopped just short of the San Francisco bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, I got off and I ran and I just leapt over the, over the, over the bridge. And, you know, the rest of the story is really beautiful, but to, to go back and, and just kind of reiterate what you just said. I mean, when we just show love and compassion and, you know, for me, I'm a Christian and, and that it, it just comes when you know the love of the Father, when you know that everything that God has done for you, he's, he's given up his, his son for, for us, for no matter what we do, no matter what happens, he's given so much love towards us. And if we can only just give a fraction of that love to the people around us, the difference that that can make in this yeah. world. Yeah. That, it, the, it's just, it, it, yeah. The son came to show the heart of the Father. Yeah. You know, yep. and that unconditional love that Jesus showed to everyone that he encountered, you know, whether like people don't realize they, oh, he, he had a tax collector who followed him. Like they were the scum of the earth Yep. in Jesus's time, yep. the s absolute scum of the earth and prostitutes, tax collectors. It didn't matter. The love because when you can see through what a person does to who they are in their soul and that they are, I mean, that's that, that sanctity of the human spirit. You yep. know, you have, we have to look through people's actions and words to remember who they are as a human being. Yep. And then maybe we can, we can. And that's what brings me to this work day to day. I, I think about the dignity of every single human being and people like your friend Jay may be the anomaly. They may be, you know, the, the, the few, but I think about the dignity of all of the people who don't want to be doing this yeah. and they have purpose in life and they have dignity and I will fight for their dignity. Even oh. if they can't fight for their dignity themselves, I will fight for it. And so many of us, fighting in this industry for their dignity are doing that day to day. Oh my God. I love it. Bethany, would you tell everyone the best way if they want to get in touch with you or to get involved with what you're doing or how to find out more? Would you tell everybody like the best way to kind of get involved and how they can reach out to you if they have any questions or how they can help? Yeah. So to get, um, involved, um, Gosh, there's so many ways you can get involved with your your legislators in your own state. And the best way to do that is to just become friends with them. It doesn't mm. matter if they're on your side or not. Just become friends with the people that serve you in your yeah. your um, your district, your ward. Um, take them out to lunch with no agenda. So that's a really super easy way because mm. then you built a relationship. And when it's time for something that matters, a bill that really matters, mm. you have relationship with them. You have ground to stand on and they'll hopefully respect you as a person to say, I may disagree, but I respect you as a person enough to listen to your point on this. That's mm -hmm. a really easy way to get involved. Find out what your laws are in your state. Yep. Um, other ways, um, obviously, you can contact me, um, and you don't have to, I, you don't have to get involved with anything with me. But I can connect you with dozens and dozens of organizations throughout the yep. country. Um, the one that I would recommend the the most uh, would be the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Um, yeah, there's not a lot um, that you can do to physically do to help them. But they, um, if you're looking for a place to donate, they are a powerhouse. They just in the last few weeks brought the very first um, lawsuit against MindGeek, which MindGeek is the parent company that owns Pornhub. And Pornhub has been facilitating child sexual abuse and rape and assault on their, on their, uh, on oh, that website nice. Pornhub yep. for years and years and and the um the 
victims have been begging Pornhub to take it down and they haven't. So Nicosi is had just filed their very first lawsuit. They filed their first lawsuit against Twitter. A young 15 year old boy um, oh, was, heard seduced, about that. Yeah, was seduced by a, a grown adult man who he thought he was talking to another teenager. Long story short, there was a lot of per- child pornography in that and it was uploaded to Twitter and Twitter said, not we're my problem. Take it down. We're not taking yep. it down. It doesn't violate our, our code. And so Nicosi just um, filed a lawsuit against them. Nicosi is doing amazing. And they're not just a lot. They, they do tons of policy stuff. That's They started out as a policy organization, um, okay. anti-trafficking policy organization. But they just opened up a law center one year ago. And they are kicking down the doors with survivors. It's incredible. Oh, my God. That is amazing. So you can reach me through um, my email address which is expose, E-X-P-O-S-E, 7676 at gmail.com. You can also go to my website, which is exposeonline.org. Yeah, Um, exposeonline.org. And you also can be hired as a speaker. Um, You, like you said, you're an author, you're a speaker. So if people want to um, have you come speak to maybe their church or their civic organization, like a Lions yep. Club or like a Rotary or something like that. Yep. They can I've hire you for that. done it all the time. Yep. Do it. Matter of fact, in the last, I don't know, maybe four months with my connection in Vermont, Maggie, um, she's gotten me into, gosh, probably six places to speak on TV, you know, TV and radio things and civic uh Council, here. council meetings here. Yep. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's what I got a message from her. I don't remember if it was on Facebook or if she found my email. I don't remember how she found me, but she was like, you need to talk to Bethany. And I was like, yes, that would be great. She's been a powerhouse advocate in Vermont for me. So I, 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 I appreciate her tremendously. Oh my God. So awesome. And then everybody who was listening, Bill. So currently in this legislative session, it's Bill H-268, it is, um, H-268 is looking at the, uh, the study. Uh, decriminalizing and doing the study and, um, and all of that stuff. So make sure you reach out to your legislators. Uh, I don't, we don't know where it is in the process yet. So it's in, it's a house, it, the H means it's in the house so contact your reps for sure. Um, I always contact my senators as well. Uh, you can go to the, you can go to the legislature, it's legislature.vermont.gov. You can find all the bills. You can find all your legislators. Um, and I probably should, I probably should look into this organization before I promote them, but there's this website called commoncause.org. I, this is not an endorsement. I have no idea what they do. Do not hold it against me. But you can go to commoncause.org slash find your representative. And it gives you everyone who is elected that represents you. So when I type in my address, it not only gives me my president, you know, uh, my president, the president, and <laughs> um, and my legislators, you know, like Leahy and Sanders and, and Welsh, it also is, I mean, it goes all the way down to my city council. So it tells you everybody. So go there, find out who your reps are, message them. Their emails are online at Vermont, legislature.vermont.org. Is that what I said? Wait, where'd it go? legislature.vermont.gov. Um, get involved, do something, anything. Yes. Anything. One thing. Be involved. Stay involved. Go say hello to your neighbors. And that's what we've got for you this evening. Uh, Bethany, hold on with me one second while I end the live stream. Uh, and thank you everybody for watching. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for your questions and comments. Uh, Make sure to share this content. Uh, You know, the more we can get in front of the eyeballs of your friends and neighbors, the more people we can influence. And so, uh, you know, comment, like, share. If you're on YouTube, subscribe and share. uh, Because the more engagement we get, the more the social media platforms will uh, boost our content to share it to people who matter and who really need to hear this information. So thank you for your support. Thank you again, Bethany, for being here and have a good night, everybody.
Oh, where's my, where's my doohickey? Okay. <laughs>